Good morning, everyone. I think we're ready to get started for our Archives Week program. I'm Susan Carter, Curator and Registrar for the Henry Plant Museum, joined by Heather Truby Brown, Curator of Education. And we're pleased to be with you this morning. Um, this is a program that's uh, been put together for Archives Awareness Week. And this is an event that started way back in 1992, and we're proud to say that we've been a part of it since the very first year. Um, we want to thank Jennifer Dietz with the City Archives. She's the City Archivist and Records Manager for coordinating um, all the programs in Tampa for this week's um, broadcast. And today happens to be the City of Tampa's birthday. So happy birthday, City of Tampa. Um, I'd also like to thank Cynthia Gandy Zenever, our executive director, and our board of trustees for allowing us to do this program. Um, we decided on this subject, sports, at the Tampa Bay Hotel because it ties in with our current exhibit that's called The Sport in Life. And we used a lot of materials from our archives and other archives putting it together and we thought it would be fun to share some of our discoveries and fascinating facts that we learned along the way. Um, Heather, do you wanna show the first slide? Here we have a centerfold picture from one of Henry Plant's advertising brochures. And if you look at the corners, you can see some of the sporting activities that were popular here at this hotel. You can see bicycling and golf, um, horse carriage rides, boating, um, fishing. And those were some of the popular activities here. And our exhibit features activities that were popular not only here in Tampa, but at other Gilded Age resorts throughout America. So we invite you to come down and, and check those things out. Um, this was a popular advertising print that was used in periodicals such as Life Magazine and other publications from the period to lure people to Florida and get them to want to come and stay here. And who couldn't resist when you saw something like this? Um, this is out of a rare brochure, and I think we have a picture of the cover of it. Very colorful. And this is the kind of brochure that was sent all over the country to magazine um, editors, newspaper editors, all around to um, get people attracted to come to Florida. But this is very colorful. This one was done in 1898 and it features golf on the cover. And the amazing thing right inside the front cover, we discovered a layout of the golf links. It's the only time we've ever seen the layout of the Tampa Bay Hotel golf links. And you can, if you zoom in, if you're able to zoom in a little bit, you might see that it says railroad. And so it shows you where the railroad spur was coming into the back of the building. And then when you go to the mural that I'm actually standing behind, it shows you um, kind of where it is. It was on the west side of the property and you can see the hotel way back there in the background. And this is a wonderful image that came to us from Rollins College over in Winter Park. And they happen to have this because they also had a plant hotel called the Seminole. And so they have a lot of great materials over there too. So we were able to borrow this from their archives and we blew it up into a wall mural to go along with our uh, current exhibit. But it shows the golfing party all there with their clubs. And we think it was kind of fun. They show the number 18 there, but we think um, looking at that picture of the links, they had to play it twice to get all 18 holes in. But um, Anyway, in the center of that picture is John Gillespie with the golf clubs. And you'll see him again in another picture. He was a golf pro that Mr. Plant brought in to teach the game of golf to the guest because it was such a new sport um, for the hotel. But Plant was uh, very innovative and wanted to be out there and have the most current things available. This is a picture that shows the golfing party with Tom Dunn teeing off. He was a golf pro who also came here to help with the game of golf. And you can see the rickshaws there in the background. They would carry guests from the hotel down to the golf course and these rickshaws because it was probably about a good eight to a quarter of a mile away from the main building. But I love looking at the um, clothing and the outfits 
And that a lot of times that's how we're able to date these uh, photographs. So we know this was in the 1890s because the skirts were long. Um, the ladies had long sleeves, high necked blouses, and the gentlemen's outfits didn't change quite as much. Um, and it's harder to date when you don't have a woman in the picture. But anyway, um, again, this is Tom Dunn. And then here's a picture of the golf shack or the golf house out back where they kept their equipment. And the sign in the back says, no loafing allowed. If you follow us on Facebook, I think this recently appeared on Facebook. But the gentleman just to the left of the photograph of the uh, sign is Mr. Gillespie, Colonel Gillespie. And he was from Scotland. So a lot of times he wore his Scottish kilt um, to uh, teach the game. And a uh, fun fact about him, he was mayor of Sarasota for many years. So he's well known in these parts. Um, next, I'm going to show you something that's been way down deep in the archives for many, many years. We have a couple of guest books and a couple of guest index books. Um, guest registers and guest index books. And the index book, um, the hotel clerk or office manager made this from the original register and they would go through the main register where everybody signed in and alphabetize the names. So this is an alphabetic list. This happens to be the H's. And we went to this page on purpose because Bucky Harris is signed in here. And back then he was, his real name was Stanley Harris. And he was with the Washington Ball Club. That's what it says there that Heather's um, marking for us. But the interesting thing is the Washington Senators Ball Club had training camp here at the hotel in the 1920s. And so we had this wonderful volunteer, Mona Gardner, who was a retired professor. And she's been going through the registers and not only cataloging them, but researching the names. And that's the fascinating part because she discovered not only the whole Washington Senators baseball team, but that five of the fellows became future Hall of Famers. So we think that is just fascinating. Here's another page with another one of them signed in. Clark Griffith is on this page, as well as Leon Goslin, Goose Goslin. And it's um, just fascinating to go through here and look at what we can discover off an index such as this. We know the room number. And Leon Goslin, Goose Goslin, stayed in room 105. And today, we know that that room is part of the museum. Today, we use that as our music room inside the museum. So next time you come through, think about Goose Goslin staying in that room. Um, further down, I believe we have Clark Griffith on there. Okay, and then um, going on down, we have a page that shows Sam Rice signed in. He was one of the Hall of Famers. And it tells you when they arrived and when they departed. And these guys stayed for a month or two uh, in residence at the hotel. And another fun fact is they were a lot of them on the first floor. So those were the most sought after rooms. So they had really great rooms when they were in residence here. And um, Sam Rice happened to stay in room 128 that would be way down the hall on the other side by the admissions office. And then we know that um, Walter Johnson came. And the interesting thing about him coming, he stayed in room 108 and his wife and children came as well. So it was fun to see that. They didn't name her by name, but they said Mrs. and children. And their rooms are circled 106 and 108. And today we know those two rooms are adjoining. We use those for offices in the museum. So one would be Todd and Scott's office and the other is our executive director's office. So they were all right there linked together. So that's um, fun as well. And Susan, if I might interject, one of the other fun things is that the registers or the index also indicates the price that was paid for the rooms. Exactly. And we haven't done a lot of research into those prices, but you know, they ranged from $6 to $14. So it probably depended on if you had one room, if the room had a bath, if it was a suite of rooms, a lot of different things came into play to figure out those rates. And that would be a whole other research project that we'll have to do when we get time. Um, another person that signed in was Kennesaw Mountain Landis. 
and he was the baseball commissioner from 1920 to 1944. And um, he only stayed one night, but he was uh, way up high, I think in one of the uh, upper floor rooms on the third floor, they had him up on the third floor. Perhaps all the rooms were taken when he got here, who knows? Here's a scene that shows the uh, field. I think, Heather, were you gonna talk about plant field a little bit? I was, I started to and realized I was muted. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so here we do, as Susan mentioned, have a picture of plant field where the, the teams practiced for spring training while they were staying in the hotel. Mr. Plant had built a baseball diamond. And the interesting thing about this photograph is also on the far on the back side, you can see this fence line running around here. This wasn't just a baseball diamond. This also had a racetrack that encircled the field and there were grandstands. And so Mr. Plant had built this area as a, a multi-use complex, sports and amusements complex, because also in later years, the state fair was held at these areas on the, and as the fairgrounds. And so he was really building something as a multi-purpose event venue, sort of what is similar to maybe the Amarillo Arena today being a, a multi-event space. So we have this picture of the baseball field and the Washington Senators are, are playing. And this is courtesy of the Hillsborough County Public Library System. This is part of their Burgett Brothers collection housed at the John F. Germany Library. And so it's a, a fun image of, of the field. And in addition to the information that we were able to gain from the guest index about the sports team, we also find fascinating information from postcards that were written by guests staying at the hotel. Now this particular, this is the back of a postcard that we have in the archives. And if you note, if you can see it up here at the top, there's a little three. And this is indicating that this is the third card in, in a series uh, that was written to someone and unfortunately, we only have card three, but card three gives us a lot of fascinating details. Um, in it, it's mentioning, this guest is mentioning that they've, they've been to a revival that's held in Tampa and that um, it was suggested that Amy McPherson was going to be there, but Billy Sunday was also there. And if you're not familiar with those two individuals, they were famous evangelicals um, who were going around touring the country and holding revivals during the, the 1920s. And so this guest, her name is Gertrude. It's signed at the bottom of the card. She's talking about that. But the reason we have this included with sports is she mentions how she was going to an exhibition game there at Plant Field with the Washington Senators playing. And Billy Sunday, that famous evangelist, was umpire for the game. Now, Billy Sunday had started his career as a professional baseball player in the 1880s and um, didn't, didn't do exceptionally well. And so eventually, he, he, at one point, he found religion and decided that his calling was to be uh, a preacher. And so he struck out as that as his career. But baseball was always near and dear to his heart. So as he toured the country preaching, if there was a baseball game in the area, he would often facilitate his umpire. And so this card mentions that Billy Sunday, right here was the umpire, umpire. And Gertrude goes on to mention that the Cincinnati Reds will be um, playing an exhibition game next week here against the Senators. And so it's just a fascinating piece of information. And as we try to piece together these details of when Billy Sunday was, was in town, uh, Susan mentioned our volunteer, Mona Gardner, who's been doing a lot of this research, She's trying to pinpoint the time because this postcard is not postmarked. You can see here it's not postmarked. Um, we don't know when this took place. So she's trying to use these bits of information. And um, we think that this was possibly 1927 when, when this particular guest was here watching this game and Billy Sunday was umpire. Susan, did you have anything that you wanted to add about that? Uh, that's exactly right. Mona has um, pinpointed that it, it is, in fact, 27. And we've done that from the facts that are written on the back. And then the front of the card that you don't see shows the Bachman Band. 
and we found out Bachman Band performed in Plant Park in 1927. So that pretty much narrows it down. We were hoping this card was from the time when Babe Ruth hit that famous home run, but um, here, I'll let you talk about that, Heather. Well, as, as Susan mentioned, uh, one of the notable points of Plant Field is that Babe Ruth hit his longest home run back in 1919. And so even though we, we don't think that that was the game where Billy Sunday was the umpire, according to the plaque, Billy Sunday was in town uh, and threw the first pitch of that game. And here on the plaque, it states, and there are also newspaper reports from this time period saying, supporting the fact that Billy Sunday threw the first ball of the game and when Babe hit that longest home run, he would, he, that, that ball from that home run was given to Billy Sunday. So the property has a, a great connection to baseball history. Another popular activity at the hotel was bicycling. And on the far right of this old photograph, archives, you can see a sign and the sign indicates bicycles not allowed past this notice. So they didn't want bicycles riding around in the beautiful um, landscape plant park in the early years, but they did have bicycle paths on the property. And next we show a group of uh, young children out in front of the hotel. And I think they were probably guests of the hotel because the little boy has something in his mouth and we looked at it under magnification and it appears to be an orange blossom. <laughs> and the local kids, you know, we're used to orange trees. We don't really care about orange blossoms, but a tourist would think those were super cool. And anyway, he's got an orange blossom in his mouth and they used to sell orange blossoms in the Tampa Bay Hotel lobby. They had a little stand and it said orange blossoms. So I don't know if they sold them or gave them away or what, but. Anyway, the little girl is um, on a safety bike and we have one of those on display in our current exhibit. So we hope you'll get to peek in sometime soon and see the actual a Elliott bicycle on display. Um, and this is a photo, that photograph was recently added to the archive. So you just never know when things are gonna turn up. It makes it fascinating for us um, to discover new things because um, we love pictures that show people. Um, we have a zillion pictures of the building and the grounds, but when you see something with people in it, it just brings it to life. And that's what we like the best. So we just wish we knew who these children were and where they came from, and maybe we'll discover that someday. You just never know. So we're constantly getting to add things. And Susan, if I might interject, it's also all these different pieces from our archives create a much um, more complete picture and also an interesting picture of the property because the previous picture showed the sign that said no bi bicycles on these paths and yet the hotel advertising material mentioned miles of bicycle paths and so it just raises that question well where where did they ride if they couldn't ride in front of the building the paths must have been on the west side of the building so it's just interesting adding to these pieces it certainly is some other um, photographs that show sports would be tennis. And this is an early picture we um, added to the archives in the 1990s. And it's terrific because it shows a tennis game going on. And we know that James Dwight was a referee in 1892 and he happened to be the father of American tennis. So he was here on the grounds. And the back of this photograph indicates that um, John Wilkinson Nichols was here as well. And he was also a tennis pro. But I love seeing the canvas uh, parasols out there to shade them from the sun. And just this week we discovered or noticed, you know, you look at a picture a million times and you might not notice things, but we noticed that the tennis court was positioned to face east and west. So some of the players would have had that afternoon sun blazing in their eyes um, when they played. Um, next, this picture shows um, some indoor activities that would have been popular. We have the ping pong set up at the top or table tennis, as it was known. And we discovered in one of the old historic brochures that it mentioned ladies ping pong and pool. And it said on the first floor near the office. 
So that indicates it must have been, you know, on the first floor of the hotel. I was thinking it was downstairs in the basement where they had the billiard tables, but apparently they had a special room on the first floor for table tennis and um, other games. And the second shelf and third shelf show you parlor croquet, a very miniature little set that was made for a tabletop. The little mallets are only about a foot long and you can see the little wickets that are set up there and you could have just had a fun game of parlor croquet on your uh, table at the time. So that would be something fun for us to play today during quarantine, but we can't find the sets. Well, and also, um, Susan, interestingly about sports, it, it really was something, these were games in miniature so that folks could enjoy them inside, especially in the winter months when it was cold or it got darker earlier. Um, and also if it was extremely hot outside, these would have required a little less vigorous activity. Exactly. Let me change pictures here. Next up, we have uh, a recent acquisition to the museum and it's in poor condition, but we love it because of the story that it tells. The engraving says Tampa Bay Hotel track meet consolation prize won by Chaz Weber, January 4th, 1913. And this came up at auction in the area recently, this past spring and we successfully won it. And we thought all along that it was for a track meet, like a running race. But what we discovered, I'm gonna let Heather share, is something completely different. It is, and I, I just have to, I, I guess, elaborate on, express my enthusiasm about this sort of thing because more than once when we've been preparing for an exhibit, coincidentally, serendipitously, we have found a new piece of fabulous artifact relating to the Tampa Bay Hotel. And, and this is an example of that. And so um, just something that came up as we were beginning um, to install this exhibit. And so really, really fortunate because we knew with the racetrack, which we saw part of in the, the previous image that showed the baseball field, we knew that there were horse races here and we'd heard there were motorcycle races and we knew that there were auto races but we didn't know a lot about the motorcycle racing. And so when this piece came up and we started to research, the staff was doing research on this, we, we learned a whole lot more about that element of races here at the Tampa Bay Hotel. And so the local newspapers, the Tampa Times, um, reported on this particular race that was originally meant to, to run on New Year's Day, 1913, but due to rain, as we'll see in a later picture, the, the track was dirt. So due to rain, they had to, can, they had to postpone it because of the track conditions. Well, when it came around to January 4th, there, there was, um, there's a very fascinating and colorful backstory to all of this. There were two very, very uh, popular and uh, followed motorcycle racers in the area, Luigi Torres and Johnny, I apologize, let me- Marcicano. Mar Marcicana, thank you, who were, had very staunch camps of who would follow them and, and cheer them in their racing. And so they were supposed to be racing in this meet. So when it came around to the, the third or the fourth, um, Luis Torres, he, he decided he didn't want to race because he was upset about the fact that the, the winning uh, purse, the, the prize money would be winner take all and he was wanting it to be a 60-40 split so that regardless of the outcome, if he won or lost, he'd still walk away with some money. And since the, the officials wouldn't, wouldn't agree to that, he decided, I'm not, I'm not racing. So Johnny Marsicano got on the track, he raced around a couple times and, and won by default. Um, but, but the interesting thing about this particular race was there were multiple motorcycle races as part of this day's event. And for the races that, for the, the races where the, the drivers weren't the winners, there was another race called the consolation race. And so the winner of the consolation race, so it was basically for all those who didn't win, um, was Charles Weber. And so they did have this trophy for that consolation race that he won. 
and he rode an Excelsior motorcycle. And the other fascinating thing about this that, that came out in the research was at the time, the, the Merkel, the Excelsior, the Indian, those were all popular and uh, well-respected motorcycle brands. But also in this particular race on the fourth, in these various motorcycle races, some of the drivers were, were riding Harley Davidson motorcycles and they won. And, and because of that surprise outcome, they had gone the fastest. One of them recorded, and, and this is all in the, the local newspaper at the time, that his Harley Davidson was going 60 miles per hour on the straightaway and 45 miles per hour around the curves. And because he was able to maintain consistent speed, he got ahead of the leaders and, and won the race. And so since Harley Davidson motorcycles performed so well, that inspired the formation of the local Harley Davidson Motorcycle Riding Club. And at that point, Harley Davidson kind of took off and um, gained a little more popularity and credibility in racing circles. So it was just fascinating to, to learn this about the Tampa Bay Hotel specifically, but then a little bit about Tampa history and even motorcycle history. And so here's another view then of the cup. It's, it's not very large, it's about eight inches tall, but what you see below this in the display case is a pair of racing goggles. And we have a few different pairs on loan from other institutions. And the reason they would be so important for racing is as I mentioned, the track was dirt. So when the track was dry, it was very, very dusty. And when it was damp, it was muddy. And so you would, drivers would need protective eyewear so that they could have <laughs> clearer vision. And then this photo is from, again, the Burgett Brothers collection, part of the, the public library, the Hillsborough County Public Library System and their collection. And so it, it's just been fascinating to look at our archives through the, from the perspective of looking specifically at sports that, that were here from our, our paper objects that we have, like this ad that we started with, to some of the, the more three-dimensional objects that, that we've been able to share in this, in this um, conversation. So Susan, was there anything else um, about either the hotel or in general here? No, I think that about sums it up. We wanted to save a little bit of time for questions if anybody had questions. And we definitely would like for, to invite everyone to come over and see the exhibit. And if you can't make it here, please go on our online exhibit on our uh, website, plantmuseum.com website, and you can view the exhibit. And there's also some wonderful old footage that shows different sports at other Gilded Age resorts um, that's fun to see. So Susan, we have, I'm gonna stop the screen share and go to the questions. We have had some come in. One was asking about the image of the, the children in front of the hotel with their bicycles, that little sign in the background. They wanted to know what that said. Um, off the top of my head, I believe it said something about bicycles not allowed past this point. Yes. And it was hard to see. We had to use magnifying glasses, but that's the gist of it. Um, they didn't want you riding your bikes through the formal gardens. <laughs> and then some other questions. How do you pick and choose what you want in an exhibit? Well, we brainstorm a lot and we look and see what we have in our archives and then we write off to um, other local museums around the state, sometimes around the country and, you know, borrow and get things on loan from them if we need to fill it in. And that's very much what we did for this particular show. And it makes it interesting because it involves more of the community that way and we learn more that way. And I have to say it is interesting that as we start exploring, we may, we may know that another institution has certain items, but then as we start talking about the exhibit, oftentimes they say, oh, well, we have this other item. And so it leads us to learn more and also think about, well, maybe that object would better represent what we're trying to tell, the story that we're trying to tell with the exhibit. So it's, it's an evolving process. I'm right, saying. that's what makes it, um so much of a discovery for us. And a lot of times, 
you know, we can reach out and people find things that they don't even know that they have that relate into the hotel. Um, so we're definitely hoping to find some more guest indexes and guest registers. Those are our favorites right now. And another question, Susan, is how often do you add to the archives and where do you find materials? Well, we add um, as often as we can. We have a lot of museum members that are friends that watch auction sites for us. I watch auction sites. Um, we were finding a lot of material at the Antiquarian Book Fair, but of course it was canceled this year. But um, we've built up a rapport with a lot of the Antiquarian Book Dealers and people throughout the country. We might buy something one year and then they keep in touch with us. So sometimes they send things or you know links to things and we get to, to look and choose that way. And other times people just write us. Um, recently, you know, we get phone calls and inquiries all the time. People will be going through estates or attics and um, family, you know, documents and find something from the hotel. And we're always fascinated. We can't take every single thing, but um, one thing that we can add are the archival items, the paper items that reveal a lot. We don't have a lot of space for furniture items, but of course it depends on what it is. If we can find it in a photograph, um, then we really seek it. But we just have to keep our eyes and ears open. I know our docents interact with a lot of the um, tourists that come here and visitors, and many times those visitors will go home. And then when they're out antiquing, they might discover something they never really were aware of, and they might buy it for us and send it to us. So we're always thrilled to get items like that. Another question relating to bicycles. Do we know if guests brought their own bicycles or were they available for rent or purchase at the Tampa Bay Hotel? That's something we really don't know. Um, with Plan and his railroad trains, I'm sure that you could have brought your bicycle if you wished. Um, he had room for them. I know um, people could bring their dogs and things like that down on the train. So I don't see why a bicycle wouldn't fit right on a rail car also, um, but we don't know that. That's the sort of information we would love to find. And then is there one missing document or archival material that the museum would enjoy discovering and would solve a particular mystery or open questions? Yes, we would like to find that very first guest register from 1891 when, you know, a lot of the famous guests and people were here. They said they had 4,000 people come for the opening. Well, we would love to see some of those names um, of the ones that actually got to stay in the hotel and anything like that would uh, reveal, you know, a lot of new resources for us. And I would, I would agree that the guest registers would just be such a wealth of information and open so many more questions about who stayed here and, and maybe why they were coming here to, to explore those kinds of things to see. Right, and Mr. Plant had a publication called The Orange Blossom. And those of you that are members are well familiar with The Orange Blossom. That's why we named our newsletter that. But um, there are more Orange Blossom copies somewhere um, and we don't have them all. We only have about three of them. And it was a publication that went on for a number of years. So those reveal a lot of information on the hotel and who was here and coming and going. So um, any things like that that we could discover would be wonderful. Well, and along those lines of, of thinking about the guests uh, a lot being a hotel, um, we had a question come in, do we know much about the hotel staff? After all, they were a a tremendously important part of the hotel system to be able to make the guest experience possible. Do we have a lot of information about the staff? We don't have a lot, but we're gaining more year by year. We have a wonderful professor, Dr. Charles McGraw Grow, and he has um, put his students on finding a lot of that information. And we've made some fascinating discoveries. Some of that is on the online exhibits that we offer on through the website. You can check that out. Another question is how often do you use other archives um, other than the museums? Um, really all the time. I mean, we're constantly looking for information. We might get a question that we have to answer and 
if we don't have it in our archives, yes, we write off. We're on a lot of the listservs and we can put in a query and find out the answer. And I think that's something too, as we, for gaps that we may have in Tampa Bay Hotel specific information and, and knowing about the guest experience and, and what was going on, oftentimes other archives of, of grand hotels can give a, a general insight into the experience. So even though it's not specific to the Tampa Bay Hotel, it can sometimes help inform a little bit of the narrative of, of the Tampa Bay Hotel. So I, I would say we do use other archives quite frequently and not just grand hotels, but library resources and things, uh, locations like that, historical societies. Right, right. No, we definitely do. There's a lot of information out there and especially now with the World Wide Web, it's easier to find than it used to be because I can remember years ago going to the library and sitting there working those microfilm readers and it was you just about went blind trying to see the information and you try to print it and you'd have to tape it all together and it was crazy and um, today researchers don't have to go through all that it's a lot easier and then where can people go to learn more about the museum the hotel what we do and who we are I'd say um, go to our website, join the museum. We'd love to have you as a member if you're not already a member and you'll get a lot of information that way. And um, we have a wonderful um, video that you can watch online that gives a wealth of information. But we have a lot of material on the website. It's grown in recent years and we're very proud of it. Well, I, I have a question. Um, is there anything that in in doing this was was something that you were excited to share or a new discovery something that was uh that that you hadn't thought of that now has shed new light on an aspect of the the hotel well one of the things that i learned that i just think is fascinating is who stayed in what rooms that are here just from looking over that guest register or guest index book. Um, I just think it's fascinating that ball players stayed in the rooms that are now part of the museum. Well, and I also think um, it's interesting, Susan, you had mentioned as we were preparing for this, that the thing about those guest registers and the index, they, they sat for a long time, just sat in the archives. And it wasn't really until one of our volunteers, Mona Gardner, started to go through it and really look at the names that that we discovered what valuable information we had. Yes, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more information. Every name reveals something. Um, a lot of business people came here, you know, from afar. They weren't all local. So there's a lot, just a wealth of information that can be gathered from each index. And we only have about four, I think. So we, we certainly hope to gain some more. But in 20, you know, or 30 years, we haven't had any, you know, new, new book surface, but we'll see. I have a, a, a theory that a lot of the hotel managers, maybe if we research the hotel managers, we could find some of the guest books. Perhaps that's something they took home as a memento, and it could be in their archives if there are any wherever they resided, because a lot of them came down from the north. So if we researched each and of the managers that we know about, and we know about 15 different managers, perhaps we could find something in their family papers. It's just um, a matter of time and, and digging. Well, Susan, those are all the questions from, um, from our viewers. And so I'd like to say thank you to everyone for joining us this morning and for participating in, in the Henry Plant Museum's Archives Awareness Week program that's by the city of Tampa. And so if you haven't experienced or, or tuned into some of the other programs that the city is offering this week, I definitely encourage you to do so. Susan, do you have any closing comments? Yes, I would just um, reiterate and say that there are a lot of partners with Archives Week. There's uh, USF, the Tampa Bay History Center, Tampa Museum of Art, the Hillsborough County Public Library System, um, the Ybor City Museum, Tampa Historical Society, and the Tampa Firefighters Museum, as well as the city archives. 
So um, please go to the website. It's on that final slide. I don't know if you can put that up, but that has the link. There we go, tampagov.net forward slash AAW. And you can find a lot more information, online programs and um, other events that are of interest. So please explore that and happy birthday, City of Tampa. And also the museum is open. So we hope you'll visit us online, but also in person. Okay, thank, thank you all. You.